In a previous video, we built this circuit that generates a valid VGA signal, and when we plugged a monitor in, we saw that the monitor recognized that it was in 800 by 600 mode. And that's because we're sending it the right horizontal and vertical sync pulses for that mode. You know, we're sending a 3.2 microsecond uh, horizontal sync pulse, 38 whatever thousand times per second, and we're sending a, a 0 0.1056 millisecond sync pulse of uh, 60 times per second. And the way this all works is we have a binary counter here that's counting from 0 to 264, you know, over and over again, and it's counting at exactly 10 million times per second. And so we can look for these particular values to get the pulse width and the pulse frequency to match exactly. And then same thing in the vertical direction. You know, we've got another counter here that counts each line on the screen from 0 to 628. And of course, you know, we measured all the timing and everything in the last video to make sure it matched the specs, and it did. And so we saw the monitor recognize it as a valid signal. And so if you want to know more about what's going on here, I definitely recommend you check out the first video. But now, you know, we probably want to actually display something on the screen. And to do that, the VGA interface has a few more signals for red, green, and blue. And, you know, because we're using these sync signals here to stay synchronized with the monitor, we can use our horizontal and vertical counters to keep track of what part of the screen the monitor is currently painting at the moment. And so this 0 to 200 tells us where it is from left to right, and then the 0 to 600 will tell us where it is from top to bottom. And so as the monitor paints the screen, you know, left to right, top to bottom, the same way you'd read a page uh, on a, in a book, these red, green, and blue signals will is how we tell the monitor what color pixel we want at that particular location. So in other words, because we're synchronized, we can use our counters to know exactly what pixel the monitor is painting at the moment. So for example, if I take uh, just one bit from one of these counters, so this is the, the vertical counter, if I take the, you know, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16's place, let's say, this 16's place bit uh, right here you know, as we count down the screen from 0 to 600 down the screen, this bit is going to flip on or off every 16 scan lines. So if I take that bit and hook it up to the, the green signal, and I'm going to hook it up through a resistor for reasons that I'll get into here in a minute, there we go. You, know, you can see every 16 lines, the green flips on and off. And that's because as our vertical counter counts from 0 to 600, every 16 counts, this 16 places bit flips on and off because that's how binary counters work. Now, if I hook the red up here to the eights place in the same way, there we go. And now you now you can see the green and the red, as well as uh, yellow when the two mix. And then, of course, you know I can also hook up blue. So let me just do that for the sake of completeness. And now you can see the three primary colors mix to give us actually sixteen uh, distinct colors. But you know, as much fun as colorful stripes are, what I really want to do is display a more complex picture. And for that to work, we need the pixel data stored in some memory somewhere. Now, normally in a computer, the data for whatever's on the screen is stored in a part of RAM. Uh, that way the software running on the computer can just write new data to the same RAM location, and the image on the screen will change right away. But I'm not going to hook this to a computer, at least not yet, uh, so I'm just going to store the image on an EEPROM. And this is a 28C256 EEPROM, so it'll hold 32K of data, which should be enough for an image of some sort. And the way this will work is we already have our horizontal and vertical counters giving us an X and a Y position. And if we feed all of those signals into the addresses of the EEPROM, then the EEPROM will give us a byte stored at that address, and that byte could be the color of the pixel for that particular X, Y location. So that's how we'll store the image in the EEPROM. But there's one weird issue, which is because we went with the 10 megahertz pixel clock instead of 40 megahertz, we only have 200 pixels by 600 instead of 800 by 600. And 200 by 600 is kind of a weird resolution. You know, the pixels would be kind of stretched out because really what we're doing is we're repeating each pixel four times as we go across. So it'd be nice to maybe slow our vertical counter down so we repeat each line four times as well. And it's actually pretty easy to do. So if we have our counter counting in binary like this, you know, here we're just counting 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 16, you know, just counting in binary. Well, if we lop off that last bit, now it goes 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, and so forth up to 8. And if we lop off another bit, then it repeats each number four times and only counts up to 4 instead of counting to 16. So if we just ignore the bottom two bits of our Y counter, that'll divide the counter by 4. We actually still have another problem, which is the EEPROM I have, the 28C256. It actually only has 15 address lines, so we couldn't fit all these address lines here even if we wanted to. So we've actually got to get rid of at least three address lines in order for it to actually fit in this EEPROM. So given what we've got with this EEPROM, and to keep the right proportions, I ended up having to drop three bits from our Y counter and one bit from the X counter. And that leaves us with a final image resolution of 100 pixels by 75 pixels, which, you know, I don't know, is maybe not the most impressive resolution, but, I mean, what do you want from me? I'm trying to build a video card on breadboards. 
So 100 by 75 is, is what we get. So let's hook the EEPROM up like this. I'll start by adding another breadboard and connecting power and ground to the EEPROM. Then I'll tie the write enable pin high since we'll only be reading and it's active low. And output enable and chip enable are both active low as well, so I'll tie them both low so everything's enabled for output. Then the first seven address lines go down to our horizontal counter, and again we're skipping the first bit. And the next seven address lines go to the vertical counter, and this time skipping the first three bits. So that's 14 address lines, seven for X, seven for Y. There is a 15th address line which we're not gonna use, so I'll just tie that to ground. So now we've got all of our address lines connected like this. So for each of our 100 by 75 pixels, we should be getting a byte of data out here that'll presumably tell us what color that pixel should be. But how are we gonna turn this 8-bit data into the signal that the VGA monitor expects? Well, the VGA interface has three pins, red, green, and blue, and each expects a voltage between zero and 0.7 volts. And depending on what that voltage is, whether it's closer to zero volts or closer to 0.7 volts, determines how much of each color is mixed together to determine the color of the pixel. But if we've got eight bits here of data that are either zero volts or five volts, how do we get something that's 0.7 volts? Well, this is a case where we have one voltage and we need a lower voltage, and so we can use a voltage divider. And a voltage divider is just two resistors like this. So relative to ground, down here we've got zero volts, and up at the top we've got five volts. And in the middle here, it's gonna be somewhere between zero and five volts. And how far it is from zero volts to five volts depends on how big R2 is compared to the total resistance. So if R2 is half of the total resistance, that is R1 and R2 are the same value, then in the middle here, we're gonna have half the voltage, so two and a half volts. If R2 were 10% of the total resistance, then we'd have 10% of the total voltage or, or half a volt. So this expression uh, just describes that. You just look at the proportion of R2 to the total resistance, and then that tells you how much of the total voltage you get. Now the VGA spec says that the red, green, and blue signals it says, you know, zero to 0.7 volts, but it also says it's got this 75 ohm input impedance. And you can roughly think of that as meaning that inside the monitor, those red, green, and blue inputs are kind of connected to ground like this through a 75 ohm uh, load of some kind. So if we've got five volts and we want to get it down to 0.7 volts as it's going into the monitor here, we can just add a resistor like this and that creates a, a voltage divider, right? So we've got five volts at the top, we've got ground here at the bottom, and we want this to be 0.7 volts here in the middle. So now if the monitor's input impedance is 75 ohms, we can't change that, uh, but we can put whatever resistor we want here between our five volts and the input to the monitor. And you know, to figure out what resistor that needs to be in order to get 0.7 volts, well, we can just look at this expression here and say, you know, when would this expression equal 0.7 volts uh, given that R2 is, is gonna be 75 ohms? Well, we can put uh, 75 ohms in here for R2 and set it equal to 0.7 volts, and we just need to solve for R. So five times 75 is, is 375, and then R plus 75 times 0.7 is gonna be 0.7 R plus 52 and a half. Subtract that 52 and a half from both sides, we get 0.7 R uh, equals 322 and a half. We can divide that by 0.7, and uh, we get R equal to 460.7 ohms. So if we take five volts and we put it through a 460.7 ohm resistor, we'll have 0.7 volts here going into our monitor, you know, given that there's a 75 ohm load inside that monitor. But ideally, we don't just want 0.7 volts or zero volts going into the monitor here. You know, ideally we'd be able to have a range of voltages between zero and 0.7 volts so we can get different brightnesses of red, green, and blue, you know, so that we're able to have different shades of colors. So for example, if we wanted four different voltages from zero to 0.7, you know, evenly spaced, uh, so we could get four different shades of red, green, and blue, We'd have to solve this equation essentially for each of those different voltages to find out what resistor we need to get that particular voltage. So that's what I've done here. That's what these different resistances are. And this is for you know one third brightness, two thirds brightness, and then of course full brightness at 0.7 volts, which is what we just we just figured out is 460.7. And we could use these different resistances to get these different voltages so that we end up with these different uh, brightness levels for each of the colors. But of course, you know, they don't make 1555.4 ohm resistors they make you know 1500 ohm resistors and they don't make 722.9 ohm resistors but you know i've got 680 ohms which is maybe close enough so if we use those resistors to build something like this that's got two inputs over here that can be you know either zero or five volts and an output over here then check this out you know if both inputs are zero like this then the output's obviously going to be zero volts right but if one input here is five volts 
uh, so the one hooked to the 1.5k resistor is 5 volts, and this is a zero, then essentially we're kind of in this scenario here where we have, you know, approximately 1500k or 1500 ohm resistor, and we're going to get about 0.23 volts over here. But if we flip that around and we, we don't have anything here, and we have 5 volts down here, then we're going through the 680 ohm resistor and we're going to have, you know, about 700, or well, we're going to have about 0.47 volts. But then if we have ones on both of these inputs, so both of these inputs are 5 volts, well then these resistors are going to combine in parallel. And to combine resistors in parallel, you use uh, this uh, expression here, which is sort of the sum of or the reciprocal of the sum of the reciprocals. Uh, so to combine 1500 ohms and 680 ohms in parallel like this, it's going to appear as a single resistance from 5 volts to this point over here of 468, which is pretty close to here, and so we're going to get 0.7 volts. So this takes two inputs that can either be 0 or 5 volts and gives us the four different possibilities that give us these four different voltage levels from 0 up to 0.7 volts. And so with just a couple resistors, we can take two bits of binary data and convert that into one of four different voltage levels from 0 to 0.7 volts. And if we do that for red, green, and blue, then we can use six bits of data coming out of our EEPROM to get four different shades of red, green, and blue, which combine into 64 different colors. And so this is the mapping for those different colors, if you're familiar with these hex codes for colors. But you can see the last two bits here controls how much blue there is. Uh, the middle two bits controls how much green there is. And then the first two bits controls how much red there is. And then this here is what those actual colors look like. And so those are the 64 colors that we're able to generate with a circuit like this. So let's actually hook these resistors up to the outputs of our EEPROM. And so here are the 1.5K resistors. And of course, there's three of them, one for red, green, and blue. And here are the 680 ohm resistors. And so I'll hook the first two data bits up for blue. And the first one's going to go to a 1.5k resistor. And then the next one will go to a 680 ohm resistor. Then the next two bits will be for green. So go to a 1.5k resistor. And then to a 680 ohm resistor. And then finally the last two bits are going to be for red. The 1.5k resistor and the 680 ohm resistor. And then we just need to tie this side of the, the resistors for each color together. So I'll do blue, green, and red. And so now over on this side, we should be getting that voltage between 0 and 0.7 volts. So now we can try hooking this up to the monitor again. So here's our 15-pin uh, VGA connector. And I've got the, the same sync signals before in the ground, of course. But now I've got the red, green, and blue hooked up to pins 1, 2, and 3. So we can hook up ground and hook up our sync signals as before. So the horizontal sync and the vertical sync. And then the colors we can just hook up over on this side of the resistors. So there's blue, there's green, and there's red. So now if we power up our circuit and plug in the monitor, so we basically see the same thing as before. So the monitor comes alive, so it's detecting the sync signal, but it's still a blank screen. And of course that could be because what's in the EEPROM is just blank, but I happen to know that this is an erased EEPROM, and when you erase an EEPROM, it, it just writes all ones. So we should actually see a white screen, and we're not. But I think the problem is that if every address in the EEPROM is set to all ones, then we're going to be outputting a white for every position. And that includes even in the blanking time here. And we really shouldn't be putting out any pixels in this blanking time because, well, it should be blank. And in fact, this is one of those things that might actually damage a CRT monitor, and hopefully won't damage my monitor. But the way we can fix that is to use these signals that we're detecting here for the blanking intervals, right? Because we're, we're actually detecting when we're in this horizontal blanking uh, interval uh, right here with this flip-flop, and we're detecting when we're in the, the vertical blanking interval down here. So really what we need to do is we need to figure out, are we in that blanking interval and those together? And we could actually use the result of that for the output enable signal for our EEPROM. So we can essentially turn the output of the EEPROM off if we're in that blanking interval. So what I'm going to do is add a NAND gate here. And I'm using a NAND gate so that the output is inverted because our chip enable, or not our chip enable, well, actually both, but the output enable, which is the one we're going to use, the output enable is active low. So that way, if, if two inputs here are high, then the output will be low. And then the two inputs that we'll use is we'll, we'll look at if we're in the display period for horizontal and the display period for vertical. So let me hook up power and ground for our NAND gate. And so the first input here is going to say, are we in the horizontal display period? So in other words, this is saying, are we in this time here? And then the next input is going to say, are we in the vertical display period? So that's going to say, are we in this time here vertically? And if the answer is yes, if we're in both of those, 
Then what we want to do is we want to take the, the output of that and use that instead of just always tying our output enable low. So here we'll say output enable only when both of these conditions are true. So now let's reconnect our monitor and see what we get. And that's still not working, but it's possible that I've got these mixed up and so I'm actually outputting only during the blanking interval. So let me just switch this over to the inverted outputs on both of these. And there we go. Now it actually looks like we're getting, uh, looks like a white screen. So if we want to display something a little more interesting, then we've got to come up with a little more interesting image. So let's find an image that's nice and colorful. This looks good, public domain, that's perfect. So I'll download, uh, I guess, you know, we're gonna reduce the uh, resolution here quite a bit, so it doesn't matter too much. So then if I load that image up in Photoshop, we can resize it. So we want our image to be 100 by 75. So 100 by, well, make it 114 by 75, and then we can crop it to 100 by 75. Okay, so there's our image with the resolution that we have on our screen. And so now we need to change the color mode, so we're using uh, indexed color, and we want a custom palette. And so these are the 64 colors that we can produce with our resistor voltage dividers. And they're also in the, in the right order. So for example, an index of eight is this you know, green color. And if we have an eight in our EEPROM, then that's gonna produce that same green color. So it's pretty important that we have the right colors in here and we have them in the right order. So if we apply that, this is the image we get. So those are the 64 colors that we support and it's a 100 by 75. So that is, uh, that is the best our wonderful breadboard video card can do. So let's go ahead and save this. We'll call it image.png. And if we actually look at what's in that file, we see, you know, there's more than just the pixel data, right? There's a header here, PNG. There's, you know, appears to be some XML stuff in here. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in here that, that we definitely don't want to write to our EEPROM. So what we've got to do is we've got to convert this PNG data into the pixel bytes that we want to put into our, into our EEPROM. And the best way I can think to do that is just with a little Python script. We can use a Python image library to, to make it a little bit easier. So pill is this Python image library. And we can open up an image file and then we can load the image. And when we load the image, what we get is we just get a two dimensional array of, of the pixels. And because we're using indexed colors with eight bits and you know, we've got our colors in the right order here with the right index values, the pixels that we end up loading are gonna be the values that we wanna actually output from our EEPROM to get those particular colors. So really what we wanna do is we just wanna write all those pixels to a file without any of the PNG header information, without any compression, without anything like that. We just wanna write the raw pixels to a file and then we can write that file to the EEPROM. So what I'm gonna do is just go through all the pixels. And since our image is 100 by 75, I'll just go through all 75 lines and then go through all 100 pixels per line. And then I just wanna write the value of that pixel to a file. So I'll create an output file, just call it image.bin. And we'll just write to this as a binary file. And what we'll write to it is we'll write a character that has the value of the pixel. So the pixel is gonna be coming from our pixels array and it's just gonna be at the XY value that we're at. And so if we run this, that'll create that image.bin file. And if we look at the image.bin file, what we should see in here is we should see all of the pixels. So I don't know if this looks like a bird to you, but uh, one sign that we're on the right track here is that all of these uh, values in here are less than 64. Or, well, they're in hex, but they're less than 40 hex, which is, which is 64. So at least everything seems to be you know, in, the, in the right range. But this isn't quite how we want to organize the data in the EEPROM. Because remember, we're using seven bits for the X position and seven bits for the Y position. And so because we have 100 pixels per row, we have this X counter that goes up to 99. But once it gets to 99, it doesn't just go to 100, it goes back to zero, and then we increment our Y position. And so the actual address in the EEPROM will jump from 99 to 128, because these will all go to zero, and then this bit will be a one, and that's the 128th place. So in the EEPROM, really, even though we only have 100 pixels per line on the screen, in the EEPROM, we, we want to take up 128 pixels per line. But that's easy enough. We can just, for each line, instead of 100, we can just do 128. And then because we're writing that 128 times, we'll end up writing 128 things to the file. So let's run the conversion again, and we get an error. So image index out of range, and that's because you know our image uh, only has uh, only has 100 pixels across. So you know when we're trying to get pixel 128 or, or even pixel 101 or 100, uh, that pixel is not actually in our image. So what we can do is we can just try to catch that condition. 
So if we get an index error when we try to get that, that pixel that's not actually part of our picture, what we can do is we can still write to the file, but the character will write to the file will just be, I mean, it could be anything, but I guess we'll just write a zero. So let's run that. And now if we look at our image, we still see the data, but what we see is we see, okay, this must be the first 100 pixels. And then we have a bunch of zeros that padded out to 128. And so you can see like this block here, that's the first line. And then this next block here, with all the zeros padding it out to the end, that's the next line. And so this should be the format of data that we want to put into the EEPROM. Now, I suppose I could use the EEPROM programmer that I built in a previous video. But in this case, because I've got all the data in a file and everything already, it's probably easiest just to use a commercial EEPROM programmer. It's also a lot faster. Let's pop our EEPROM out, put it in the programmer. And then I'll use Mini Pro, which is just an open source EEPROM programmer tool that works with this uh, programmer. And we'll tell it we're using the AT28C256, which is the EEPROM we've got. And we want to write the image.bin file to it. And it says incorrect file size, uh, 9600. So that's because I guess it's expecting a file that's the exact size of the EEPROM. And we have a 32K EEPROM, so we need to give it a 32K file. And the reason our file is, is smaller is because our Y is only counting from 0 to 74, even though, you know, this is 7 bits, so it could go up to 128. And actually, there's an A14, right? That's, that's this extra... Uh, address line that we just tied to zero. So there's actually another eight bits here. So our Y value really could go from zero to 255, but we're only writing the first 70, uh, 75 values of that. Uh, and that's just so that our you know image aspect ratio makes sense. But we can do the same thing here. We can just change this to 256. And then anything that's out of range, we'll just write a zero to the file. So let's reconvert. And then if we take a look at our image file, we can see the image. But then if we go all the way down to the, yeah, if we go all the way down to the bottom, it says we have got a row of zeros. And then I think this star just means everything is zeros between there and uh, 8000, which is 32,000. So let's try to write it again. And there we go. It's writing it. And so now let's put our EEPROM back in and see if we get the picture of that bird. Hey, and there it goes. And so this is our completed video card, uh, but you know, it's producing an image from the ROM. So I'm going to call that a success. Well, you might notice these thin black vertical lines. And I think that's because the ROM I'm using is relatively slow. Yes, I'm using a 10 megahertz clock, which means it's counting 10 million times per second or, you know, once every hundred nanoseconds. But remember the monitor still assumes I'm using a 40 megahertz clock. So really the monitor is expecting a pixel every 25 nanoseconds. And so here's the problem. If we look at the data sheet for the EEPROM that we're using, there's a delay from when the address goes valid, the address lines are valid, to when the output is valid. That's this TACC, or access time. And if we look at access time here, the address to output delay, it's a you know, maximum or up to 150 nanoseconds for the dash 15, which is the one I'm using. Well, 25 nanoseconds per pixel, 150 nanosecond delay could mean up to six pixels could be invalid in this, in this period from when the address changes to when the output is actually valid. And, you know, it makes sense that sometimes invalid might just mean that the output is zero. And so I think that's why we sometimes see a few black pixels like this. Now, in a computer, like I mentioned before, the image would be stored in SDRAM, which is designed to be very fast to access for this very reason. And of course, the, you know, the software running on the computer could write new data to that RAM and the image would change right away. Whereas here, the only way to change the image is to reprogram and, or, or swap the EEPROM, which, as you can see, even if I speed it up when I edit the video, is, is pretty slow. But, you know, that's not really the point, is it? You know, really the goal was just to get some kind of image on the screen, and I'd say this is a success. And if you want to try this yourself, you can head over to my website. I've got schematics, data sheets, and, you know, where you can get all the parts. And as always, you know, I want to thank my patrons for making it possible for me to create videos like this. As you can imagine, these were rather time-consuming videos to plan out and produce. And without the support of these people and all my patrons who are just viewers like you, making this kind of video just wouldn't be possible. So thank you.